67. The Ugliest Man And again did Zarathustra's feet run through mountains and forests, and his eyes sought and sought, but nowhere was he to be seen whom they wanted to see, the sorely distressed sufferer and crier. On the whole way, however, he rejoiced in his heart and was full of gratitude. What good things, said he, hath this day given me as amends for its bad beginning? What strange interlocutors have I found? At their words will I now chew a long while, as at good corn. Small shall my teeth grind and crush them, until they flow like milk into my soul. When, however, the path again curved round a rock, all at once the landscape changed, and Zarathustra entered into a realm of death. Here bristled aloft black and red cliffs, without any grass, tree, or bird's voice, for it was a valley which all animals avoided, even the beasts of prey, except that a species of ugly, thick green serpent came here to die when they became old. Therefore the shepherds called this valley Serpent Death. Zarathustra, however, became absorbed in dark recollections, for it seemed to him as if he had once before stood in this valley, and much heaviness settled on his mind, so that he walked slowly and always more slowly, and at last stood still. Then, however, when he opened his eyes— he saw something sitting by the wayside, shaped like a man, and hardly like a man, something nondescript. And all at once there came over Zarathustra a great shame, because he had gazed on such a thing. Blushing up to the very roots of his white hair, he turned aside his glance, and raised his foot that he might leave this ill-starred place. Then, however, became the dead wilderness vocal, for from the ground a noise welled up, gurgling and rattling, as water gurgleth and rattleth at night through stopped-up water-pipes. And at last it turned into human voice and human speech. It sounded thus, Zarathustra, Zarathustra, read my riddle. Say, say, what is the revenge on the witness? I entice thee back. Here is smooth ice. See to it, see to it, that thy pride doth not here break its legs. Thou thinkest thyself wise, thou proud Zarathustra. Read then the riddle, thou hard nutcracker, the riddle that I am. Say then, who am I? When, however, Zarathustra had heard these words, what think ye then took place in his soul? Pity overcame him, and he sank down all at once like an oak that hath long withstood many tree-fellers, heavily, suddenly, to the terror even of those who meant to fell it. But immediately he got up again from the ground, and his countenance became stern. I know thee well, said he with a brazen voice. Thou art the murderer of God. Let me go. Thou couldst not endure him who beheld thee, Whoever beheld thee, through and through, thou ugliest man, thou tookest revenge on this witness. Thus spake Zarathustra, and was about to go, but the nondescript grasped at a corner of his garment, and began anew to gurgle and seek for words. Stay, said he at last. Stay, do not pass by. I have divined what axe it was that struck thee to the ground. Hail to thee, O Zarathustra, that thou art again upon thy feet. Thou hast divined, I know it well, how the man feeleth who killed him, the murderer of God. Stay, sit down here beside me. It is not to no purpose. To whom would I go but unto thee? Stay, sit down. Do not, however, look at me. Honour thus mine ugliness. They persecute me. Now art thou my last refuge, not with their hatred, not with their bailiffs. Oh, such persecution would I mock at, and be proud and cheerful. Hath not all success hitherto been with the well-persecuted ones, and he who persecuteth well learneth readily to be obsequent, when once he is put behind? But it is their pity." Their pity is it from which I flee away and flee to thee. O Zarathustra, protect me, thou my last refuge, thou sole one who divinest me. Thou hast divined how the man feeleth who killed him. Stay, and if thou wilt go, thou impatient one, go not the way that I came. That way is bad. 
Art thou angry with me because I have already racked language too long, because I have already counseled thee? But know that it is I, the ugliest man, who have also the largest, heaviest feet. Where I have gone, the way is bad. I tread all paths to death and destruction. But that thou passedst me by in silence, that thou blushedst, I saw it well. Thereby did I know thee as Zarathustra. Everyone else would have thrown to me his arms, his pity in look and speech, but for that I am not beggar enough, that didst thou divine. For that I am too rich, rich in what is great, frightful, ugliest, most unutterable. Thy shame, O Zarathustra, honoured me. With difficulty did I get out of the crowd of the pitiful, that I might find the only one who at present teacheth that pity is obtrusive, thyself, O Zarathustra. Whether it be the pity of a god, or whether it be human pity, it is offensive to modesty, and unwillingness to help may be nobler than the virtue that rusheth to do so. That, however, namely pity, is called virtue itself at present by all petty people, they have no reverence for great misfortune, great ugliness, great failure. Beyond all these do I look, as a dog looketh over the backs of thronging flocks of sheep. They are petty, good-wooled, good-willed, grey people. As the heron looketh contemptuously at shallow pools, with backward bent head, so do I look at the throng of grey little waves and wills and souls. Too long have we acknowledged them to be right, those petty people. So we have at last given them power as well, and now do they teach that good is only what petty people call good. And truth is at present what the preacher spake, who himself sprang from them, that singular saint and advocate of the petty people, who testified of himself, I am the truth. That immodest one hath long made the petty people greatly puffed up, he who taught no small error when he taught, I am the truth. Hath any modest one ever been answered more courteously? Thou, however, O Zarathustra, passedst him by, and saidst, Nay, nay, three times nay. Thou warnedst against his error, thou warnedst the first to do so against pity. Not every one, not none, but thyself and thy type. Thou art ashamed of the shame of the great sufferer, and verily when thou sayest, From pity there cometh a heavy cloud, take heed, ye men. When thou teachest, all creators are hard, all great love is beyond their pity. O Zarathustra, how well versed dost thou seem to me in weather signs. Thou thyself, however, warn thyself also against thy pity, for many are on their way to thee, many suffering, doubting, despairing, drowning, freezing ones. I warn thee also against myself. Thou hast read my best, my worst riddle, myself, and what I have done. I know the axe that felleth thee. But he had to die. He looked with eyes which beheld everything. He beheld men's depths and dregs, all his hidden ignominy and ugliness. His pity knew no modesty. He crept into my dirtiest corners. This most prying, over-intrusive, over-pitiful one had to die. He ever beheld me, and such a witness I would have revenge, or not live myself. The God who beheld everything, and also man, that God had to die. Man cannot endure it that such a witness should live. Thus spake the ugliest man. Zarathustra, however, got up, and prepared to go on, for he felt frozen to the very bowels. Thou nondescript, he said, thou warnest me against thy path. As thanks for it, I praise mine to thee. Behold, up thither is the cave of Zarathustra. My cave is large and deep, and hath many corners. There findeth he that is most hidden his hiding place, and close beside it, there are a hundred lurking places and by places for creeping, fluttering, and hopping creatures. Thou outcast, who hast cast thyself out, thou wilt not live amongst men and men's pity? Well then, do like me. 
Thus wilt thou learn also from me. Only the doer learneth. And talk first and foremost to mine animals, the proudest animal and the wisest animal. They might well be the right counsellors for us both. Thus spake Zarathustra and went his way, more thoughtfully and slowly even than before, for he asked himself many things, and hardly knew what to answer. How poor indeed is man, thought he in his heart, how ugly, how wheezy, how full of hidden shame. They tell me that man loveth himself. Ah, how great must that self-love be, how much contempt is opposed to it. Even this man hath loved himself, as he hath despised himself. A great lover may thinketh he is, and a great despiser. No one have I yet found who more thoroughly despised himself. Even that is elevation. Alas, was this, perhaps, the higher man whose cry I heard? I love the great despisers. Man is something that hath to be surpassed. 68. The Voluntary Beggar When Zarathustra had left the ugliest man, he was chilled and felt lonesome. For much coldness and lonesomeness came over his spirit, so that even his limbs became colder thereby. When, however, he wandered on and on, uphill and down, at times past green meadows, though also sometimes over wild stony couches, where formerly perhaps an impatient brook had made its bed, then he turned all at once warmer and heartier again. What hath happened unto me? he asked himself. Something warm and living quickeneth me. It must be in the neighborhood. Already am I less alone. Unconscious companions and brethren rove around me. Their warm breath toucheth my soul. When, however, he spied about and sought for the comforters of his lonesomeness, behold, there were kine there standing together on an eminence, whose proximity and smell had warmed his heart. The kine, however, seemed to listen eagerly to a speaker, and took no heed of him who approached. When, however, Zarathustra was quite nigh unto them, then did he hear plainly that a human voice spake in the midst of the kine, and apparently all of them had turned their heads towards the speaker. Then ran Zarathustra up speedily and drove the animals aside, for he feared that someone had here met with harm, which the pity of the kine would hardly be able to relieve. But in this he was deceived, for behold, there sat a man on the ground who seemed to be persuading the animals to have no fear of him, a peaceable man and preacher on the mount, out of whose eyes kindness itself preached. What dost thou seek here? called out Zarathustra in astonishment. What do I here seek? answered he. The same that thou seekest, thou mischief-maker, that is to say, happiness upon earth. To that end, however, I would fain learn of these kine, for I tell thee that I have already talked half a morning unto them, and just now were they about to give me their answer. Why dost thou disturb them? Except we be converted and become as kine, we shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven, for we ought to learn from them one thing, ruminating. And verily, although a man should gain the whole world, and yet not learn one thing, ruminating, what would it profit him? He would not be rid of his affliction. His great affliction, that, however, is at present called disgust. Who hath not, at present, his heart, his mouth, and his eyes full of disgust? Thou also, thou also, but behold these kine. Thus spake the preacher on the mount, and turned then his own look towards Zarathustra, for hitherto it had rested lovingly on the kine. Then, however, he put on a different expression. Who is this with whom I talk? he exclaimed, frightened, and sprang up from the ground. This is the man without disgust. This is Zarathustra himself, the surmounter of the great disgust. This is the eye. This is the mouth. This is the heart of Zarathustra himself. And whilst he thus spake, he kissed with all flowing eyes the hands of him with whom he spake, and behaved altogether like one to whom a precious gift and jewel hath fallen unawares from heaven. The kind, however, gazed at it all and wondered. Speak not of me, thou strange one, thou amiable one, said Zarathustra, and restrained his affection. Speak to me firstly of thyself. 
Art thou not the voluntary beggar who once cast away great riches, who was ashamed of his riches and of the rich, and fled to the poorest to bestow upon them his abundance and his heart? But they received him not. But they received me not, said the voluntary beggar. Thou knowest it forsooth. So I went at last to the animals and to those kine. Then learnest thou, interrupted Zarathustra, how much harder it is to give properly than to take properly, and that bestowing well is an art, the last subtlest master art of kindness. Especially nowadays, answered the voluntary beggar, at present, that is to say, when everything low hath become rebellious and exclusive and haughty in its manner, in the manner of the populace. For the hour hath come, thou knowest it, forsooth, for the great, evil, long, slow, mob and slave insurrection, it extendeth and extendeth. Now doth it provoke the lower classes, all benevolence and petty giving, and the over-rich may be on their guard. Whoever at present drip like bulgy bottles out of all two small necks, of such bottles at present one willingly breaketh the necks, Wanton avidity, bilious envy, careworn revenge, populous pride, all these struck mine eye. It is no longer true that the poor are blessed. The kingdom of heaven, however, is with the kine. And why is it not with the rich? asked Zarathustra temptingly, while he kept back the kine which sniffed familiarly at the peaceful one. Why dost thou tempt me? answered the other. Thou knowest it thyself better even than I. What was it drove me to the poorest, O Zarathustra? Was it not my disgust at the richest? At the culprits of riches, with cold eyes and rank thoughts, who pick up profit out of all kinds of rubbish, at this rabble that stinketh to heaven. At this gilded, falsified populace, whose fathers were pickpockets or carrion crows or rag pickers, with wives compliant, lewd and forgetful, for they are all of them not far different from harlots. Populous above, populous below, what are poor and rich at present? That distinction did I unlearn. Then did I flee away further and ever further until I came to those kine. Thus spake the peaceful one, and puffed himself and perspired with his words, so that the kine wondered anew. Zarathustra, however, kept looking into his face with a smile. All the time the man talked so severely, and shook silently his head. Thou doest violence to thyself, thou preacher on the mount, when thou usest such severe words, for such severity neither thy mouth nor thine eye have been given thee. Nor, methinketh, hath thy stomach either. Unto it all such rage and hatred and foaming over is repugnant. Thy stomach wanteth softer things. Thou art not a butcher. Rather seemest thou to me a plant-eater and a root-man. Perhaps thou grindest corn. Certainly, however, thou art averse to fleshly joys, and thou lovest honey. Thou hast divined me well, answered the voluntary beggar with lightened heart. I love honey. I also grind corn, for I have sought out what tasteth sweetly and maketh pure breath. Also what requireth a long time— a day's work and a mouth's work for gentle idlers and sluggards. Furthest, to be sure, have those kind carried it. They have devised ruminating and lying in the sun. They also abstain from all heavy thoughts which inflate the heart. Well, said Zarathustra, thou shouldst also see mine animals, mine eagle and my serpent. Their like do not at present exist on earth. Behold, Thither leadeth the way to my cave. Be to-night its guest, and talk to mine animals of the happiness of animals. Until I myself come home, for now a cry of distress calleth me hastily away from thee. Also, shouldst thou find new honey with me, ice-cold, golden-comb honey, eat it. Now, however, take leave at once of thy kind, thou strange one, thou amiable one, though it be hard for thee for they are thy warmest friends and preceptors. One excepted whom I hold still dearer, answered the voluntary beggar. Thou thyself art good, O Zarathustra, 
and better even than a cow. Away, away with thee, thou evil flatterer, cried Zarathustra mischievously. Why dost thou spoil me with such praise and flattery, honey? Away, away from me, cried he once more, and heaved his stick at the fond beggar, who, however, ran nimbly away. 69. The Shadow Scarcely, however, was the voluntary beggar gone in haste, and Zarathustra again alone, when he heard behind him a new voice, which called out, Stay, Zarathustra, do wait, it is myself, forsooth, O Zarathustra, myself, thy shadow. But Zarathustra did not wait, for a sudden irritation came over him on account of the crowd and the crowding in his mountains. Whither hath my lonesomeness gone? spake he. It is verily becoming too much for me. These mountains swarm. My kingdom is no longer of this world. I require new mountains. My shadow calleth me. What matter about my shadow? Let it run after me. I run away from it. Thus spake Zarathustra to his heart and ran away. But the one behind followed after him, so that immediately there were three runners, one after the other, namely, foremost, the voluntary beggar, then Zarathustra, and thirdly and hindmost his shadow. But not long had they run thus when Zarathustra became conscious of his folly, and shook off with one jerk all his irritation and detestation. What, said he, have not the most ludicrous things always happened to us old anchorites and saints? Verily my folly hath grown big in the mountains, now do I hear six old fools' legs rattling behind one another. But doth Zarathustra need to be frightened by his shadow? Also methinketh that after all it hath longer legs than mine. Thus spake Zarathustra, and laughing with eyes and entrails, he stood still and turned round quickly, and behold, he almost thereby threw his shadow and follower to the ground, so closely had the latter followed at his heels, and so weak was he. For when Zarathustra scrutinized him with his glance, he was frightened as by a sudden apparition. So slender, swarthy, hollow, and worn out did this follower appear. Who art thou? asked Zarathustra vehemently. What doest thou here? And why callest thou thyself my shadow? Thou art not pleasing unto me. Forgive me, answered the shadow, that it is I. And if I please thee not, well, O Zarathustra, Therein do I admire thee and thy good taste. A wanderer am I, who have walked long at thy heels, always on the way, but without a goal, also without a home, so that verily I lack little of being the eternally wandering Jew, except that I am not eternal and not a Jew. What, must I ever be on the way, whirled by every wind, unsettled, driven about? O oh, earth, thou hast become too round for me. On every surface have I already sat, like tired dust have I fallen asleep on mirrors and window panes. Everything taketh from me, nothing giveth. I become thin, I am almost equal to a shadow. After thee, however, O Zarathustra, did I fly, and high longest, and though I hid myself from thee, I was nevertheless thy best shadow, wherever thou hast sat. There sat I also. With thee have I wandered about in the remotest, coldest worlds, like a phantom that voluntarily haunteth winter roofs and snows. With thee have I pushed into all the forbidden, or the worst and the furthest, and if there be anything of virtue in me, it is that I have had no fear of any prohibition. With thee have I broken up whatever my heart revered, all boundary stones and statues have I o'erthrown. The most dangerous wishes did I pursue, verily beyond every crime did I once go. With thee did I unlearn the belief in words and worths, and in great names. When the devil casteth his skin, doth not his name also fall away? It is also skin. The devil himself is perhaps skin. Nothing is true, all is permitted, so said I to myself. Into the coldest water did I plunge with head and heart. Ah, how oft did I stand there naked on that account, like a red crab! Ah, where have gone all my goodness and all my shame and all my belief in the good? Ah, where is the lying innocence which I once possessed, 
the innocence of the good and of their noble lies. Too oft, verily, did I follow close to the heels of truth. Then did it kick me in the face. Sometimes I meant to lie, and, behold, then only did I hit the truth. Too much hath become clear unto me. Now it doth not concern me any more. Nothing liveth any longer that I love. How should I still love myself? To live as I incline, or not to live at all, so do I wish. So wisheth also the holiest. But alas, how have I still inclination? Have I still a goal, a haven towards which my sail is set? A good wind? Ah, he only who knoweth whither he saileth knoweth what wind is good, and a fair wind for him. What still remaineth to me? A heart weary and flippant, an unstable will, fluttering wings, a broken backbone. This seeking for my home, O Zarathustra, dost thou know that this seeking hath been my home sickening? It eateth me up. Where is my home? For it do I ask and seek, and have sought, but have not found it. O eternal everywhere, O eternal nowhere, O eternal in vain. Thus spake the shadow, and Zarathustra's countenance lengthened at his words. Thou art my shadow, said he at last, sadly. Thy danger is not small, thou free spirit and wanderer. Thou hast had a bad day. See that a still worse evening doth not overtake thee. To such unsettled ones as thou seemeth at last even a prisoner blessed. Didst thou ever see how captured criminals sleep? They sleep quietly. They enjoy their new security. Beware lest in the end a narrow faith capture thee, a hard rigorous delusion. For now everything that is narrow and fixed seduceth and tempteth thee. Thou hast lost thy goal. Alas, how wilt thou forego and forget that loss? Thereby hast thou also lost thy way. Thou poor rover and rambler, thou tired butterfly, wilt thou have a rest and a home this evening? Then go up to my cave. Thither leadeth the way to my cave, and now will I run quickly away from thee again. Already lieth, as it were, a shadow upon me. I will run alone so that it may again become bright around me. Therefore must I still be a long time merrily upon my legs. In the evening, however, there will be dancing with me. Thus spake Zarathustra. 70. Noontide And Zarathustra ran and ran, but he found no one else and was alone, and ever found himself again. He enjoyed and quaffed his solitude, and thought of good things for hours. About the hour of noontide, however, when the sun stood exactly over Zarathustra's head, he passed an old bent and gnarled tree which was encircled round by the ardent love of a vine, and hidden from itself. From this there hung yellow grapes in abundance, confronting the wanderer. Then he felt inclined to quench a little thirst, and to break off for himself a cluster of grapes. When, however, he had already his arm outstretched for that purpose, he felt still more inclined for something else, namely to lie down beside the tree at the hour of perfect noontide and sleep. This Zarathustra did, and no sooner had he laid himself on the ground in the stillness and secrecy of the variegated grass than he had forgotten his little thirst and fell asleep. For as the proverb of Zarathustra saith, one thing is more necessary than the other only that his eyes remained open, for they never grew weary of viewing and admiring the tree and the love of the vine. In falling asleep, however, Zarathustra spake thus to his heart, Hush, hush, hath not the world now become perfect? What hath happened unto me? As a delicate wind danceth invisibly upon parquet seas, light, feather light, so danceth sleep upon me. No eye doth it close to me, it leaveth my soul awake. Light is it, verily feather light. It persuadeth me, I know not how, it toucheth me inwardly with a caressing hand, it constraineth me, yea, it constraineth me so that my soul stretcheth itself out. How long and weary it becometh my strange soul, 
Hath a seventh day evening come to it precisely at noontide? Hath it already wandered too long blissfully among good and ripe things? It stretcheth itself out long, longer. It lieth still, my strange soul. Too many good things hath it already tasted. This golden sadness oppresseth it. It distorteth its mouth. As a ship that putteth into the calmest cove, it now draweth up to the land, weary of long voyages and uncertain seas. Is not the land more faithful? As such a ship huggeth the shore, tuggeth the shore, then it sufficeth for a spider to spin its thread from the ship to the land. No stronger ropes are required there. As such a weary ship in the calmest cove, so do I also now repose, nigh to the earth, faithful, trusting, waiting, bound to it with the lightest threads. O oh, happiness, O oh, happiness, wilt thou perhaps sing, O oh, my soul? Thou liest in the grass, but this is the secret, solemn hour, when no shepherd playeth his pipe. Take care, hot noontide sleepeth on the fields. Do not sing, hush, the world is perfect. Do not sing, thou prairie bird, my soul, do not even whisper, lo, hush, the old noontide sleepeth, it moveth its mouth. Doth it not just now drink a drop of happiness? An old brown drop of golden happiness, golden wine, something whisketh over it, its happiness laugheth, thus laugheth a god. Hush! For happiness, how little sufficeth for happiness! Thus spake I once and thought myself wise, but it was a blasphemy. That have I now learned. Wise fools speak better. The least thing precisely, the gentlest thing, the lightest thing, a lizard's rustling, a breath, a whisk, an eye glance, little maketh up the best happiness. Hush! What hath befallen me? Hark! Hath time flown away? Do I not fall? Have I not fallen? Hark! Into the well of eternity. What happeneth to me? Hush! It stingeth me. Alas, to the heart, to the heart, O oh, break up, break up my heart after such happiness, after such a sting. What, hath not the world just now become perfect, round and ripe? O oh, for the golden round ring, whither doth it fly? Let me run after it, quick. Hush! And here Zarathustra stretched himself and felt that he was asleep. Up! said he to himself, thou sleeper, thou noontide sleeper. Well then, up, ye old legs, it is time and more than time, many a good stretch of road is still awaiting you. Now have ye slept your fill, for how long a time? A half eternity. Well then, up now, mine old heart, for how long after such a sleep mayest thou remain awake? But then did he fall asleep anew, and his soul spake against him and defended itself and lay down again. Leave me alone. Hush! Hath not the world just now become perfect? Oh, for the golden round ball! Get up, said Zarathustra, thou little thief, thou sluggard. What, still stretching thyself, yawning, sighing, falling into deep wells? Who art thou then, O oh my soul? And here he became frightened, for a sunbeam shot down from heaven upon his face. O oh, heaven above me! said he, sighing, and sat upright. Thou gazest at me? Thou hearkenest unto my strange soul? When wilt thou drink this drop of dew that fell down upon all earthly things? When wilt thou drink this strange soul? When, thou well of eternity, thou joyous, awful noontide abyss, when wilt thou drink my soul back into thee? Thus spake Zarathustra, and rose from his couch beside the tree, as if awakening from a strange drunkenness. And behold, there stood the sun still exactly above his head. One might, however, rightly infer therefrom that Zarathustra had not then slept long. 71. The Greeting It was late in the afternoon only when Zarathustra, after long useless searching and strolling about, again came home to his cave. When, however, he stood over against it, not more than twenty paces therefrom, the thing happened which he now least of all expected. 
he heard anew the great cry of distress, and extraordinary. This time the cry came out of his own cave. It was a long, manifold, peculiar cry, and Zarathustra plainly distinguished that it was composed of many voices, although heard at a distance, it might sound like the cry out of a single mouth. Thereupon Zarathustra rushed forward to his cave, and behold, what a spectacle awaited him after that concert! For there did they all sit together whom he had passed during the day, the king on the right and the king on the left, the old magician, the pope, the voluntary beggar, the shadow, the intellectually conscientious one, the sorrowful soothsayer, and the ass. The ugliest man, however, had set a crown on his head, and had put round him two purple girdles, for he liked, like all ugly ones, to disguise himself and play the handsome person. In the midst, however, of that sorrowful company stood Zarathustra's eagle, ruffled and disquieted, for it had been called upon to answer too much, for which its pride had not any answer. The wise serpent, however, hung round its neck. All this did Zarathustra behold with great astonishment. Then, however, he scrutinized each individual guest with courteous curiosity, read their souls, and wondered anew. In the meantime, the assembled ones had risen from their seats, and waited with reverence for Zarathustra to speak. Zarathustra, however, spake thus, Ye despairing ones, ye strange ones, so it was your cry of distress that I heard, and now do I know also where he is to be sought, whom I have sought for in vain today, the higher man. In mine own cave sitteth he, the higher man, but why do I wonder? Have not I myself allured him to me by honey offerings and artful lure calls of my happiness? But it seemeth to me that ye are badly adapted for company. Ye make one another's hearts fretful, ye that cry for help, when ye sit here together. There is one that must first come. One who will make you laugh once more, a good jovial buffoon, a dancer, a wind, a wild romp, some old fool. What think ye? Forgive me, however, ye despairing ones, for speaking such trivial words before you, unworthy verily of such guests. But ye do not divine what maketh my heart wanton. Ye yourselves do it, and your aspect, forgive it me, for every one becometh courageous who beholdeth a despairing one. To encourage a despairing one, every one thinketh himself strong enough to do so. To myself have ye given this power, a good gift, mine honourable guests, an excellent guest's present. Well, do not then upbraid when I also offer you something of mine. This is mine empire and my dominion. That which is mine, however, shall this evening and tonight be yours. Mine animals shall serve you. Let my cave be your resting place. At house and home with me shall no one despair. In my purlieus do I protect everyone from his wild beasts, and that is the first thing which I offer you, security. The second thing, however, is my little finger, and when ye have that, then take the whole hand also, yea, and the heart with it. Welcome here, welcome to you, my guests. Thus spake Zarathustra, and laughed with love and mischief. After this greeting his guests bowed once more and were reverentially silent. The king on the right, however, answered him in their name. O Zarathustra, by the way in which thou hast given us thy hand and thy greeting, we recognize thee as Zarathustra. Thou hast humbled thyself before us. Almost hast thou hurt our reverence. Who, however, could have humbled himself as thou hast done with such pride? That uplifteth us ourselves. A refreshment is it to our eyes and hearts. To behold this, merely, gladly would we ascend higher mountains than this, for as eager beholders have we come, we wanted to see what brighteneth dim eyes. And lo, now is it all over with our cries of distress. Now are our minds and hearts open and enraptured. Little is lacking for our spirits to become wanton. There is nothing, O Zarathustra, that groweth more pleasingly on earth than a lofty, strong will. It is the finest growth. An entire landscape refresheth itself at one such tree.
To the pine do I compare him, O Zarathustra, which groweth up like thee, tall, silent, hardy, solitary, of the best, supplest wood, stately. In the end, however, grasping out for its dominion with strong green branches, asking weighty questions of the wind, the storm, and whatever is at home on high places, answering more weightily a commander, a victor. Oh, who should not ascend high mountains to behold such growths? At thy tree, O Zarathustra, the gloomy and ill-constituted also refresh themselves. At thy look, even the wavering become steady and heal their hearts. And verily, towards thy mountain and thy tree do many eyes turn to-day. A great longing hath arisen, and many have learned to ask, Who is Zarathustra? And those into whose ears thou hast at any time dripped thy song and thy honey, all the hidden ones, the lone dwellers and the twain dwellers, have simultaneously said to their hearts, Doth Zarathustra still live? It is no longer worth while to live. Everything is indifferent. Everything is useless. Or else we must live with Zarathustra. Why doth he not come who hath so long announced himself? Thus do many people ask, Hath solitude swallowed him up, or should we perhaps go to him? Now doth it come to pass that solitude itself becometh fragile and breaketh open, like a grave that breaketh open and can no longer hold its dead. Everywhere one seeth resurrected ones. Now do the waves rise and rise around thy mountain, O Zarathustra, and however high be thy height, many of them must rise up to thee. Thy boat shall not rest much longer on dry ground. And that we, despairing ones, have now come into thy cave, and already no longer despair, it is but a prognostic and a presage that better ones are on the way to thee. For they themselves are on the way to thee, the last remnant of God among men, that is to say, all the men of great longing, of great loathing, of great satiety. All who do not want to live unless they learn again to hope, unless they learn from thee, O Zarathustra, the great hope. Thus spake the king on the right, and seized the hand of Zarathustra in order to kiss it. But Zarathustra checked his veneration and stepped back, frightened, fleeing, as it were, silently and suddenly into the far distance. After a little while, however, he was again at home with his guests, looked at them with clear, scrutinizing eyes, and said, My guests, ye higher men, I will speak plain language and plainly with you. It is not for you that I have waited here in these mountains. Plain language and plainly? Good God! said here the king on the left to himself. One seeth he doth not know the good Occidentals, this sage out of the Orient. But he meaneth blunt language and bluntly. Well, that is not the worst taste in these days. Ye may verily all of you be higher men, continued Zarathustra, but for me ye are neither high enough nor strong enough. For me, that is to say, for the inexorable which is now silent in me, but will not always be silent. And if ye appertain to me, still it is not as my right arm. For he who himself standeth, like you, on sickly and tender legs, wisheth above all to be treated indulgently, whether he be conscious of it or hide it from himself. My arms and my legs, however, I do not treat indulgently. I do not treat my warriors indulgently. How then could ye be fit for my warfare? With you I should spoil all my victories, and many of you would tumble over if ye but heard the loud beating of my drums. Moreover, ye are not sufficiently beautiful and well-born for me. I require pure, smooth mirrors for my doctrines. On your surface even mine own likeness is distorted. On your shoulders presseth many a burden, many a recollection, many a mischievous dwarf squatteth in your corners. There is concealed populace also in you. And though ye be high and of a higher type, much in you is crooked and misshapen. There is no smith in the world that could hammer you right and straight for me. Ye are only bridges, 
may higher ones pass over upon you. Ye signify steps, so do not upbraid him who ascendeth beyond you into his height. Out of your seed there may one day arise for me a genuine son and perfect heir, but that time is distant. Ye yourselves are not those unto whom my heritage and name belong. Not for you do I wait here in these mountains, not with you may I descend for the last time. Ye have come unto me only as a presage that higher ones are on the way to me. Not the men of great longing, of great loathing, of great satiety, and that which ye call the remnant of God. Nay, nay, three times nay, for others do I wait here in these mountains, and will not lift my foot from thence without them. For higher ones, stronger ones, triumphanter ones, merrier ones, for such as are built squarely in body and soul, laughing lions must come. O my guests, ye strange ones, have ye yet heard nothing of my children, and that they are on the way to me? Do speak unto me of my gardens, of my happy isles, of my new beautiful race. Why do ye not speak unto me thereof? This guest's present do I solicit of your love, that ye speak unto me of my children. For them am I rich, for them I became poor. What have I not surrendered? What would I not surrender that I might have one thing, these children, this living plantation, these life-trees of my will and of my highest hope? Thus spake Zarathustra, and stopped suddenly in his discourse, for his longing came over him, and he closed his eyes and his mouth, because of the agitation of his heart. And all his guests also were silent, and stood still and confounded, except only that the old soothsayer made signs with his hands and his gestures. 72. The Supper For at this point the soothsayer interrupted the greeting of Zarathustra and his guests. He pressed forward as one who had no time to lose, seized Zarathustra's hand, and exclaimed, But Zarathustra! One thing is more necessary than the other, so sayest thou thyself. Well, one thing is now more necessary unto me than all others. A word at the right time. Didst thou not invite me to table? And here are many who have made long journeys. Thou dost not mean to feed us merely with discourses. Besides, all of you have thought too much about freezing, drowning, suffocating, and other bodily dangers. None of you, however, have thought of my danger, namely perishing of hunger. Thus spake the soothsayer. When Zarathustra's animals, however, heard these words, they ran away in terror, for they saw that all they had brought home during the day would not be enough to fill the one soothsayer. Likewise, perishing of thirst, continued the soothsayer, and although I hear water splashing here like words of wisdom, that is to say plenteously and unweariedly, I want wine. Not everyone is a born water drinker like Zarathustra, neither doth water suit weary and withered ones. We deserve wine. It alone giveth immediate vigour and improvised health. On this occasion, when the soothsayer was longing for wine, it happened that the king on the left, the silent one, also found expression for once. We took care, said he, about wine. I, along with my brother the king on the right, we have enough of wine, a whole ass-load of it, so there is nothing lacking but bread. Bread, replied Zarathustra, laughing when he spake. It is precisely bread that anchorites have not. But man doth not live by bread alone, but also by the flesh of good lambs, of which I have two. These shall we slaughter quickly, and cook spicily with sage. It is so that I like them, and there is also no lack of roots and fruits, good enough even for the fastidious and dainty, nor of nuts and other riddles for cracking. Thus will we have a good repast in a little while, but whoever wish to eat with us must also give a hand to the work, even the king's for with Zarathustra even a king may be a cook. This proposal appealed to the hearts of all of them, 
save that the voluntary beggar objected to the flesh and wine and spices. Just hear this glutton Zarathustra, said he jokingly. Doth one go into caves and high mountains to make such repasts? Now indeed do I understand what he once taught us, blessed be moderate poverty, and why he wisheth to do away with beggars. Be of good cheer, replied Zarathustra, as I am. Abide by thy customs, thou excellent one, grind thy corn, drink thy water, praise thy cooking, if only it make thee glad. I am a law only for mine own, I am not a law for all. He, however, who belongeth unto me must be strong of bone and light of foot. Joyous in fight and feast, no sulker, no John o' dreams, ready for the hardest task as for the feast, healthy and hale. The best belongeth unto mine and me, and if it be not given us, then do we take it, the best food, the purest sky, the strongest thoughts, the fairest women. Thus spake Zarathustra. The king on the right, however, answered and said, Strange! Did one ever hear such sensible things out of the mouth of a wise man? And verily it is the strangest thing in a wise man, if, over and above, he be still sensible and not an ass. Thus spake the king on the right, and wondered. The ass, however, with ill will, said, Yeah, to his remark. This, however, was the beginning of that long repast, which is called the supper in the history books. At this there was nothing else spoken of but the higher man. 73. The Higher Man 1. When I came unto men for the first time, then did I commit the anchorite folly, the great folly. I appeared on the marketplace. And when I spake unto all, I spake unto none. In the evening, however, rope dancers were my companions, and corpses, and I myself almost a corpse. With the new morning, however, there came unto me a new truth. Then did I learn to say, of what account to me are marketplace and populous, and populous noise and long populous ears. Ye higher men, learn this from me. On the marketplace no one believeth in higher men. But if ye will speak there, very well. The populace, however, blinketh. We are all equal. Ye higher men, so blinketh the populace. There are no higher men. We are all equal. Man is man. Before God we are all equal. Before God. Now, however, this God hath died. Before the populace, however, we will not be equal. Ye higher men, away from the marketplace. 2. Before God. Now, however, this God hath died. Ye higher men, this God was your greatest danger. Only since he lay in the grave have ye again arisen. Now only cometh the great noontide. Now only doth the higher man become master. Have ye understood this word, O my brethren? Ye are frightened. Do your hearts turn giddy? Doth the abyss here yawn for you? Doth the hellhound here yelp at you? Well, take heart, ye higher men. Now only travaileth the mountain of the human future. God hath died. Now do we desire the superman to live. 3. The most careful ask today, How is man to be maintained? Zarathustra, however, asketh, as the first and only one, how is man to be surpassed? The superman I have at heart, that is the first and only thing to me, and not man, not the neighbor, not the poorest, not the sorriest, not the best. O oh, my brethren, what I can love in man is that he is an overgoing and a downgoing, and also in you there is much that maketh me love and hope. In that ye have despised, ye higher men, that maketh me hope, for the great despisers are the great reverers. In that ye have despaired, there is much to honour, for ye have not learned to submit yourselves, ye have not learned petty policy. For today have the petty people become master, 
They all preach submission and humility and policy and diligence and consideration and the long etc. of petty virtues. Whatever is of the effeminate type, whatever originateth from the servile type, and especially the populace mishmash, that wisheth now to be master of all human destiny. Ah, oh, disgust, disgust, disgust! That asketh and asketh, and never tireth, how is man to maintain himself best, longest, most pleasantly? Thereby are they the masters of today. These masters of today surpass them, O oh my brethren. These petty people, they are the superman's greatest danger. Surpass, ye higher men, the petty virtues, the petty policy, the sand-grain considerateness, the ant-hill trumpery, the pitiable comfortableness, the happiness of the greatest number. And rather despair than submit yourselves, and verily I love you because ye know not today how to live, ye higher men, for thus do ye live best. 4. Have ye courage, O my brethren? Are ye stout-hearted? Not the courage before witnesses, but anchorite and eagle courage, which not even a god any longer beholdeth. Cold souls, mules, the blind and the drunken, I do not call stout-hearted. He hath heart who knoweth fear, but vanquisheth it, who seeth the abyss, but with pride. He who seeth the abyss, but with eagle's eyes, he who with eagle's talons graspeth the abyss, he hath courage. 5. Man is evil. So said to me for consolation all the wisest ones, Ah, if only it be still true today, for the evil is man's best force. Man must become better and eviler, so do I teach. The evilest is necessary for the superman's best. It may have been well for the preacher of the petty people to suffer and be burdened by men's sin. I, however, rejoice in great sin as my great consolation. Such things, however, are not said for long ears. Every word also is not suited for every mouth. These are fine, faraway things. At them sheep's claws shall not grasp. 6. Ye higher men, think ye that I am here to put right what ye have put wrong? Or that I wished henceforth to make snugger couches for you sufferers, or show you restless, miswandering, misclimbing ones new and easier footpaths? Nay, nay, three times nay, always more, always better ones of your type shall succumb, for ye shall always have it worse and harder, thus only. Thus only groweth man aloft to the height where the lightning striketh and shattereth him, high enough for the lightning. Towards the few, the long, the remote, go forth my soul and my seeking. Of what account to me are your many little short miseries? Ye do not yet suffer enough for me, for ye suffer from yourselves. Ye have not yet suffered from man. Ye would lie if ye spake otherwise. None of you suffereth from what I have suffered. 7. It is not enough for me that the lightning no longer doeth harm. I do not wish to conduct it away. It shall learn to work for me. My wisdom hath accumulated long like a cloud. It becometh stiller and darker. So doeth all wisdom which shall one day bear lightnings. Unto these men of today will I not be light, nor be called light. Them will I blind. Lightning of my wisdom put out their eyes. 8. Do not will anything beyond your power. There is a bad falseness in those who will beyond their power. Especially when they will great things, for they awaken distrust in great things, the subtle, false, coiners and stage players until at last they are false towards themselves, squint-eyed, whited cankers, glossed over with strong words, parade virtues and brilliant false deeds. Take good care there, ye higher men, for nothing is more precious to me and rarer than honesty. 
Is this today not that of the populace? The populace, however, knoweth not what is great and what is small, what is straight and what is honest. It is innocently crooked. It ever lieth. 9. Have a good distrust today, ye higher men, ye enheartened ones, ye open-hearted ones, and keep your reasons secret, for this today is that of the populace. What the populace once learned to believe without reasons, who could refute it to them by means of reasons? And on the marketplace one convinceth with gestures, but reasons make the populace distrustful. And when truth hath once triumphed there, then ask yourselves with good distrust what strong error hath fought for it. Be on your guard also against the learned. They hate you, because they are unproductive. They have cold, withered eyes before which every bird is unplumed. Such persons vaunt about not lying, but inability to lie is still far from being love to truth. Be on your guard. Freedom from fever is still far from being knowledge. Refrigerated spirits I do not believe in. He who cannot lie doth not know what truth is. 10. If ye would go up high, then use your own legs. Do not get yourselves carried aloft. Do not seat yourselves on other people's backs and heads. Thou hast mounted, however, on horseback. Thou now ridest briskly up to thy goal. Well, my friend, but thy lame foot is also with thee on horseback. When thou reachest thy goal, when thou alightest from thy horse, precisely on thy height, thou higher man, then wilt thou stumble. 11. Ye creating ones, ye higher men, one is only pregnant with one's own child. Do not let yourselves be imposed upon or put upon. Who then is your neighbor? Even if ye act for your neighbor, ye still do not create for him. Unlearn, I pray you, this for, ye creating ones. Your very virtue wisheth you to have naught to do with for, and on account of, and because. Against these false little words shall ye stop your ears. For one's neighbor is the virtue only of the petty people. There it is said, like and like, and hand washeth hand. They have neither the right nor the power for your self-seeking. In your self-seeking, ye creating ones, there is the foresight and foreseeing of the pregnant. What no one's eye hath yet seen, namely the fruit, this sheltereth and saveth and nourisheth your entire love. Where your entire love is, namely with your child, there is also your entire virtue. Your work, your will, is your neighbor. Let no false values impose upon you. 12. Ye creating ones, ye higher men, whoever hath to give birth is sick, whoever hath given birth, however, is unclean. Ask women, one giveth birth, not because it giveth pleasure. The pain maketh hens and poets cackle. Ye creating ones, in you there is much uncleanliness, that is because ye have had to be mothers. A new child, oh, how much new filth hath also come into the world. Go apart, he who hath given birth shall wash his soul. 13. Be not virtuous beyond your powers, and seek nothing from yourselves opposed to probability. Walk in the footsteps in which your father's virtue hath already walked. How would ye rise high if your father's will should not rise with you? He, however, who would be a firstling, let him take care, lest he also become a lastling. And where the vices of your fathers are, there should ye not set up as saints. He whose fathers were inclined for women, and for strong wine and flesh of wild boar swine, what would it be if he demanded chastity of himself? A folly would it be. Much verily doth it seem to me for such a one, if he should be the husband of one, or of two, or of three women. 
and if he founded monasteries and inscribed over their portals the way to holiness, I should still say, what good is it? It is a new folly. He hath founded for himself a penance house and refuge house. Much good may it do, but I do not believe in it. In solitude there groweth what any one bringeth into it, also the brute in one's nature. Thus is solitude inadvisable unto many. Hath there ever been anything filthier on earth than the saints of the wilderness? Around them was not only the devil loose, but also the swine. 14. Shy, ashamed, awkward, like the tiger whose spring hath failed, thus, ye higher men, have I often seen you slink aside, a cast which ye made had failed. But what doth it matter, ye dice-players? Ye had not learned to play and mock, as one must play and mock. Do we not ever sit at a great table of mocking and playing? And if great things have been a failure with you, have ye yourselves therefore been a failure? And if ye yourselves have been a failure, hath man therefore been a failure? If man, however, hath been a failure, well then, never mind. 15. The higher its type, always the seldomer doth a thing succeed. Ye higher men here, have ye not all been failures? Be of good cheer, what doth it matter? How much is still possible? Learn to laugh at yourselves as ye ought to laugh. What wonder even that ye have failed, and only half succeeded, ye half-shattered ones, Doth not man's future strive and struggle in you? Man's furthest, profoundest, star-highest issues, his prodigious powers, do not all these foam through one another in your vessel? What wonder that many a vessel shattereth? Learn to laugh at yourselves as ye ought to laugh. Ye higher men, oh, how much is still possible! And verily, how much hath already succeeded! How rich is this earth in small, good, perfect things, in well-constituted things! Set around you small, good, perfect things, ye higher men. Their golden maturity healeth the heart. The perfect teacheth one to hope. 16. What hath hitherto been the greatest sin here on earth? Was it not the word of him who said, Woe unto them that laugh now! Did he himself find no cause for laughter on the earth? Then he sought badly. A child even findeth cause for it. He did not love sufficiently. Otherwise would he also have loved us, the laughing ones. But he hated and hooted us. Wailing and teeth gnashing did he promise us. Must one then curse immediately when one doth not love? That seemeth to me bad taste. Thus did he, however, this absolute one, he sprang from the populace. And he himself just did not love sufficiently, otherwise would he have raged less, because people did not love him. All great love doth not seek love, it seeketh more. Go out of the way of all such absolute ones. They are a poor, sickly type, a populous type. They look at this life with ill will, they have an evil eye for this earth. Go out of the way of all such absolute ones. They have heavy feet and sultry hearts. They do not know how to dance. How could the earth be light to such ones? 17. Tortuously do all good things come nigh to their goal. Like cats they curve their backs. They purr inwardly with their approaching happiness. All good things laugh. His step betrayeth whether a person already walketh on his own path. Just see me walk. He, however, who cometh nigh to his goal, danceth. And verily a statue have I not become. Not yet do I stand there stiff, stupid, and stony like a pillar. I love fast racing. And though there be on earth fens and dense afflictions, he who hath light feet runneth even across the mud and danceth as upon well-swept ice. Lift up your hearts, my brethren, high, higher, and do not forget your legs. 
Lift up also your legs, ye good dancers, and better still, if ye stand upon your heads. 18. This crown of the laughter, this rose garland crown, I myself have put on this crown, I myself have consecrated my laughter. No one else have I found today potent enough for this. Zarathustra the dancer, Zarathustra the light one, who beckoneth with his pinions, one ready for flight, beckoning unto all birds, ready and prepared, a blissfully light-spirited one. Zarathustra the soothsayer, Zarathustra the sooth-laugher, no impatient one, no absolute one, one who loveth leaps and side-leaps, I myself have put on this crown. 19. Lift up your hearts, my brethren, high, higher, and do not forget your legs. Lift up also your legs, ye good dancers, and better still if ye stand upon your heads. There are also heavy animals in a state of happiness. There are club-footed ones from the beginning. Curiously do they exert themselves, like an elephant which endeavoureth to stand upon its head. Better, however, to be foolish with happiness than foolish with misfortune. Better to dance awkwardly than walk lamely. So learn, I pray you, my wisdom, ye higher men. Even the worst thing hath two good reverse sides. Even the worst thing hath good dancing legs. So learn, I pray you, ye higher men, to put yourselves on your proper legs. So unlearn, I pray you, the sorrow sighing, and all the populace sadness. Oh, how sad the buffoons of the populace seem to me today! This today, however, is that of the populace. 20. Do like unto the wind when it rusheth forth from its mountain caves. Unto its own piping will it dance. The seas tremble and leap under its footsteps. That which giveth wings to asses, that which milketh the lionesses, praised be that good unruly spirit, which cometh like a hurricane unto all the present and unto all the populace, which is hostile to thistleheads and puzzleheads, and to all withered leaves and weeds. Praised be this wild good free spirit of the storm, which danceth upon fens and afflictions as upon meadows which hateth the consumptive populous dogs, and all the ill-constituted sullen brood. Praised be this spirit of all free spirits, the laughing storm which bloweth dust into the eyes of all the melanopic and melancholic. Ye higher men, the worst thing in you is that ye have none of you learned to dance as ye ought to dance, to dance beyond yourselves. What doth it matter that ye have failed? How many things are still possible? So learn to laugh beyond yourselves. Lift up your hearts, ye good dancers, high, higher, and do not forget the good laughter. This crown of the laughter, this rose-garland crown, to you, my brethren, do I cast this crown. Laughing have I consecrated, ye higher men. Learn, I pray you, to laugh.